Good morning and welcome to all of you who are here today. For those of you who are watching online, know the sound on your computer is not uh, uh, broken. We are going this morning without uh, music from the organ or the piano and we keep Linda Thwaites in our prayers as well as she heals from her illness. Um, I also want to ask that we keep Kathleen, our new office administrator, in our prayers as well as her family at this time of grief um, in the passing of her mother this week. Uh, that was quite a surprise for her. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Um, number one, you saw the announcements up there, so there are some things going on this week, including the session and uh, the Christmas Bazaar meeting. But we are also, this is fast forwarding to Sunday, November 27th. That is the first Sunday in Advent, and we will be having uh, a new members Sunday so that anybody who would like to join Stanford as a member uh, can join on that Sunday. We have a number of people joining, but uh, please contact me if you are interested in joining with us. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention to you uh, was a gift that we have received. This gift is in memory of Jackie Grant. This is uh, for, to commemorate her time with us as an organist, and it was given to us by her very good, very long time friend, Isabel Frost. And um, we're gonna talk more about friends later, but uh, Isabel wanted to do something to commemorate her beloved friend and all the music she filled this church with, so she had this engraved, and we are going to hang it up in the choir room as a memory for Jackie. So um, you can take a look at it on your way up, or you'll see it hanging up in the back room. With that, I think we will begin our worship with our responsive call to worship that you will see on the screen. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In the company of God's saints and pilgrims, come and worship. We come with prayer and praise to find our strength renewed. So our first hymn is 803. Now we better wait for me to get this one right before me. It always takes me a couple minutes. So if you're the kind of person who likes to read music in the book, then you can. Now we're going to do our very best. You may remain seated to sing, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. All right. Come ye thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in, ere the winter storms begin. Thank you. 
Thank you. And let us pray. Gracious God, of the skittering dry leaves blowing across our paths, we come humbly to praise you this day. As evening skies descend upon us earlier and earlier, and our fingers and toes feel the nip of cool air, and we look with anticipation this week for the little laughing children who will knock on our doors, we come humbly to thank you this day. You are our God of transitions. You bring changes to the season. You bring changes to the church. You bring changes to the community. You bring changes into our lives. God of transitions, of reformation, of change. We come humbly to hear your word for us today. Merciful God, we admit that we do not always want to change. We resist. We tell ourselves that we do not need to. We justify our own words and deeds and close our eyes to your will. Forgive the hedging we do and call us again to your ways of compassion and to your truth in our lives. When we shrink from costly discipleship and we seek cheap grace, forgive our fleeting enthusiasms and our shallow commitments. Guide us always to see others through your lens and with the love and mercy we witness in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. While it is true that we have all sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. Be at peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. Our first reading this morning comes from the very beginning of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a very poetic book. However, sometimes Isaiah has to deliver very, very painful messages. Starting at chapter 1. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. And then moving to verse 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight, 
Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And now, if we could turn in our hymn book to number 64. We will sing together all three verses of Be Still and Know That I Am God. And I think you can remain seated. Ready? Be still. purpose. 
a, a roof over your head, I guess, when you're doing whatever you got to do with cucumbers. I don't even know what they'd be doing in a hut with cucumbers, but I do know in Newfoundland they're cutting the tails and the heads off the fish before they go to market. But anyhow, so that image of Jerusalem is kind of sad, and it's meant to be sad. And I think what they're saying is Jerusalem is getting cut off and, and, and desolate and lonely. And that brought me to wanting to talk about friends. And so I'm going to ask you all, do any of you have friends that go back, way back? Do you still have friends from childhood or teenage years. Put your hands up if you can still say that you have some, yeah, see I see people and me too, definitely me from five years old. She still lives in the same house. And if you think about it, because I was just at the wedding, Brittany and Jordan's wedding, it's a coming together of friends. Their friends stood up with them to be there right by their sides as they made their vows and to promise to commit to supporting them in their marriage. So what would you say the qualities of, of a friend are? What, what, what makes a good friend for you? What would you say, if you think about the people who are your friends, even if they're not long-time friends, what, what is one quality? Somebody you can confide in and you know they won't tell anybody else. Yeah, somebody that you can be the real you. You know, maybe not the person that you need to be when you go out, but the real you, the vulnerable you, and that you can trust them. That's definitely. What else? What is another quality of a friend? Yes. Non judgmental. Yes, accepting. That accepts you for who you are. Non-judgmental, not the kind of person like those friends that Job had that were constantly trying to tell him that he must have done something wrong. Probably to include in that good at listening and hearing. Listening and hearing you. Anything else we want to say about a friend? Because I know you're thinking of your friends. Supportive. Supportive, definitely. For the good times and the not so good times. Sometimes in life we have friends, but there's a little edge of jealousy. I have a one friend named Tanya, and she was always so happy for me, whether it was uh, a good thing or it, she did never compare herself. It was just she was happy for me that a good thing was happening in my life. So supportive, definitely. I saw another hand back there. Jane? Encourage her. To encourage, yes to help you see yourself the way they see you, to help you see that they believe in you and that maybe you can do more than you thought you could. Yeah. And although we, we all, we, hopefully we all know friends. We have friends. We are friends. We don't think too often about friendships in the Bible, but they are in there. And often I think that they don't name it friend. They do once in a while name it friend. But there are hints all through the Bible of, of friendships. And I'm just going to name a couple of them. You may, of course, think of other ones. But Ruth and Naomi, when Naomi could have left, but she stayed. She stayed because she was also, I mean, they were slightly related, but that doesn't matter. You can be friends with somebody you're related to. Then there's the great friendship of David, King David, but before he became king, and Jonathan. Long-time friendship there. There's the friendship between Mary and Elizabeth. When Mary goes and stays with Elizabeth, again, a kind of a distant relative, but definitely somebody she could go to for support and understanding. Then we have, and they are named friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus were definitely friends of Jesus's, dear friends of his. Jesus and the disciples, the 
theme isn't always about how they are Jesus' friend, but you know, they, they had to have been. They spent a lot of time together and they must have been friends with each other, some of them, and they must have been friends with Jesus as well. And then, if you read at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke and at the beginning of the Gospel of, at the beginning of Acts, Luke always dedicates those two books, all that writing, and by the way, he wasn't going to his computer, to his most excellent friend, Theophilus. So he actually names somebody that he is writing those books to. He's, he's, he's keeping, he's, he's trusting that he can keep all that hard work in the hands of his friend, Theophilus. And then, of course, there's Paul and Timothy, and we talked about that just a little while ago. Paul always, even in prison, reaching out to his good friend, Timothy. So friends are um, a gift. They are a gift. This past week when I was at the preaching conference, much to my surprise, I got the gift of being reunited with a friend that I studied in Indonesia with. There were three Presbyterians and three United Theology students who traveled together to Indonesia. And Indonesia was a culture shock. Nothing was the way it should be. And I became friends with a young woman named Sandra. She was United, but that's okay. <laughs> and lo and behold, there she was at the conference, and we realized we hadn't seen each other for in person in 10 years. And you know, one of the things she said was, and I've forgotten this, remember Anita how you couldn't stand to eat white rice for breakfast, and white rice for lunch, and white rice for dinner. <laughs> That you couldn't do white rice for all three meals. And remember how we used to have to find the little grocery store, the little Indonesian grocery store, so you could come up with some cereal and milk to start your days off with. <laughs> and she said, I remember that. But I was too afraid to go by myself. It was too challenging. Crossing the street in Indonesia is taking your life in your hands just to get to the convenience store. So we always went together. She supported me. And it was, it was a wonderful gift to be reunited with her. And so this morning, I just want to take a moment to think about friends. Think about the awesome gift that friends are to each and every one of us. Let us pray. Gracious God, what a gift this is that you have given us the ability to be friends, to have friends and to be friends, to know that we can count on someone, to know that someone will support us, to know that we can be real when we are hurting and we can celebrate when we are happy. Lord, this truly is a gift that cannot be unwrapped that it, it is not a tangible thing, and yet it is there, and it is available to each one of us. We thank you for our friendships. We look forward to, to the new friendships, because at any point we know that that gift can be given to us again anew in a new friendship, and friendships can start anywhere at any time. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was a friend to so many. Amen. And our second reading this morning is from Luke. And we're going to read at the beginning of chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, 
he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And now, if you'd like to turn in your hymnal to number 373. <clears throat> But the words will appear on the screen, but you might want the music in front of you. And I think I'm going to ask you to stand.
What we need is a reservation far enough in advance. And we need the money to afford said swanky dinner. And we need a suit and tie or best dress and some spiffy shoes. We need a driver or a parking spot and enough money, of course, to cover that expense as well. I did say Clifton Hill, right? Mm -hmm. But if we plan far enough ahead and save our money, it is possible for most of us good middle class people to gain entry into the establishment. You could say it's almost fun to plan it, and the anticipation is in intoxicating. But the pandemic put a whole new spin on who gets in and who does not get in. Take our health care system now, for example. We assumed in the past that if we cut the tip off the end of our Peter Pointer finger, we could go to emerge and have it reattached. Now we will likely have to wait in the hospital reception area for eight hours, be sent home, wait another eight hours in the second hospital on a second day, be sent home, and finally get the end of our finger reattached on the third day. Take the crossing from Canada to, Canada to the U.S. lately. That's the kind of thing, especially us, who live in this border town, did frequently and easily and took for granted. I miss going over the border with Jackie Grant just to get one of those fabulous ice cream cones at Dee Dee's Dairy. <laughs> All we needed was our passports and a little bit of American money. But those days of privilege are greatly eroded now. First the border was closed tight, then the requirements to get in expanded to the arrive can app or a dossier full of time-sensitive test results and documents. Heaven forbid if one didn't know what an app was, or didn't have a computer printer close at hand, or didn't have a millennial relation to take us through all of the steps. And suddenly it got, it got a whole lot harder, more frustrating, and a whole lot less fun to cross the border. For the first time in our lives, many of us discovered what it is like, what it feels like to be the ones not getting in. Of course, countless people throughout our own history have not been able to get in. The doors to restaurants, buses, restrooms, higher education, job opportunities, legal protections, and more have been closed firmly. And getting in was not just a matter of calling ahead or having enough money either. Both our scriptures today touch on the question, who gets in and who cannot get in? I don't envy Isaiah who has been given a divine vision in the time of not one, but four kings of Judah and Israel. Hear ye, oh hear ye. Just like a town crier with a big bell, he calls out over and over as he travels the land, hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. And what Isaiah was sent to say, you'll agree, isn't very good. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. In the part between the two sections of our reading today, the part I didn't read, Isaiah challenges what they so regularly take for granted in worship. 
Stop bringing meaningless offerings. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you, declares the Lord. Your hands are full of blood. So all these things that are being done, worshipful things, churchy things, all these things they have assured themselves are important in the eyes of God, as Isaiah expresses it, God hates with all God's being. Imagine spending all that time in worship and God says, you don't know me. My people do not understand. That comes with the territory usually when getting in is taken for granted. What must happen to know and understand the heart of God? On the radio station I listen to sometimes, the DJ gave a box with a $100 bill inside to his co-worker as a wedding gift. The challenge was that the box could only be opened with a secret code word. That code word has six letters and the clue to the code is this. You can have one. You can be one. You can become one. Eight months after the wedding and the co-worker still cannot guess the code word to get in that box. He guessed all kinds of words like answer, braver, change, to no avail. A six letter word. You can have one. You can be one. You can become one. Personally, I think the answer to the code to get in the box is friend. See? But nobody on that radio station has called up and asked any of us, have they? <laughs> the people of Judah and Israel thought they had the code to get in with God, to be close with God, to be in a relationship with God. Burn lots of incense in the inner sanctum, mark the sacred feasts and festivals, pray in the proper posture, but doing all these holy things while violence Poverty and oppression rained down on their neighbors' heads meant that they did not know God at all. It sounds like Isaiah, the town crier, came to condemn. But in fact, Isaiah's vision gives a really big clue to understanding God. First of all, our God of grace wants them to figure it out. Isaiah enables them to have a way into knowing God. And there are seven suggestions for them to go through. Wash and make yourselves clean. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. In other words, be a friend. Friendship, a state of enduring affection, esteem, intimacy, and trust between two people. All in all cultures, friendships are important relationships throughout, throughout a person's lifespan. If we want to know God, 
then the colors of the stained glass don't matter, nor the number of pews, or whether we kneel, sit, or stand with our hands raised high in prayer. If we want to know God, then we need to be in a state of friendship, a knowing, reciprocating, voluntary, equal, sharing relationship with others. Zacchaeus was not considered friend material in Luke's gospel. He was the last person anyone wanted as a friend. Also, he had not really been a friend to others himself, being that he was high up in the ranks of corrupt tax collection and therefore more complicit in the abuse. It wasn't just his short stature that acted as a barrier to him meeting Jesus. The attitudes of others put a hindrance to any consideration that Zacchaeus could get in to a lunch with Jesus, let alone become his friend. It was Jesus who made it possible. The mutterers didn't think that was right. <coughs> Why should Zacchaeus, of all people, get in to a lunch with Jesus? Zacchaeus hadn't followed the code. He hadn't figured out the steps, the requirements, the proper terms. <coughs> what Jesus did was shocking. And his message was not far off from Isaiah's message. Jesus gave a very big clue to those who were paying attention. First, our God of grace wanted that whole crowd of Jesus supporters in Jericho and everyone who hears this story throughout history to figure it out to show them a way into knowing God. God wants relationship, and everyone gets into God's heart. Therefore, the way of Christ is friendship first, with hopes, but no guarantees that a change of heart will follow. We do not know what Jesus said to Zacchaeus on that day, when he sat down to lunch with him. But perhaps it was to open his eyes and reveal the code to God's heart. Zacchaeus, you can have a friend in me. Zacchaeus, you can be a friend with God. Zacchaeus, you can become a friend to others. We know that what transpired at that lunch changed Zacchaeus' mind, changed his heart, changed his life. The first question is, did the muttering crowd catch the big club clue to knowing God? And the second question is, did we? Amen. Let us pray. Great and holy God, we know that through our generous giving, you can multiply the possibilities beyond imagine. Bless our gifts and make them stretch further than we can know. Bless our partners in many countries around the world as they join us and you in changing lives for the better. God of autumn, help us to be more like nature, accepting the changing seasons, like the changing of the trees, which is not about dying, but a stripping bare in preparation for inner growth. 
Knowing that to shed the outer layers will reveal the strength that is hidden underneath. God of autumn, it's so hard to let things go, our fears, our doubts, our apathy. Yet we are not alone, for you seek us out, and we have a place in your heart. You are our strength. You see the inner beauty in us and in others. You see beyond the human dressings and wish to clothe us in your love. God of autumn, help us to be more like nature, accepting the changing seasons in our lives, not because they are out of our control, but because they are in your hands. We raise up to you this day all people who have received a difficult diagnosis or who are waiting for test results. Those coping with mental illness, depression, anxiety, or dementia. Friends who are unsure and worried about transitions in their lives. We pray for all people caught up in violence and war and those who have had their lives turned upside down by natural disasters. Through all types of trials and tribulations, may we remain steadfast in our trust because you, Lord, are in our midst and working to bring life in abundance and peace. In silence, we remember before you those for whom we have a special concern this day. healing and hope. Jesus walks with us day by day to see us through every challenge, and so we claim the healing and hope he offers in the words he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as we come to our closing, I am going to ask you to stand. And instead of trying to sing and go now in peace, I think that we will just say it together. So if you would stand. Let us say it together for blessing. Go now in peace. Never be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith. Steadfast, strong, and true. Know he will guide you in all you do. Go now in love and show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. God will be there watching from above. Go now in peace, in faith, and in love. Wherever you go, God is sending you. And wherever you are, you are right where God wants you to be. Go then in God's grace, Christ's love, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Please be seated.
This morning, we invite you to the Upper Walker Wing if you would like to share a cup of tea or coffee together. You can go through to the Upper Walker Wing or um, I will be greeting people at the front door. Of course, you can greet at the front door and scoot around back to the Upper Walker Wing too. You can go whatever way you want. I wish you all a very blessed week.